But the ubiquity of distribution created by the great digital network of networks, the decline in the cost of storage, these two great achievements are poised to drive the greatest shifts in the professional domains of production and consumption of moving image. If the business model of content production is built on control expressed through distribution, it is no wonder the television industry, alongside all analog industries, is in the middle of a storm of accelerating change. All these kinds of scarcity and abundance in technology, in talent, and in distribution are also, of course, inextricably linked to the relative scarcity of availability of money. This is to say that the screen-based entertainment business was also in part built on the relative scarcity of content itself. The recording of screen-based media centered around a certain fragility of the medium itself, analog decays, around scarcity and certain kinds of minima. For example, analog filming or recording was based around an equation which required one to film or record the least possible amount of material in the shortest space of time. An equation which still operates in, for example, what we call the Grundy model of producing daily drama, although in truth this is now the European model. Digital technology enabled the emergence of the democratic performance genre we call reality television, and it transformed the economics of the television business by shifting the balance of money to material recorded. Whereas historically film and television had centered on the filming of the least possible amount of material in the shortest time possible, digital technology allowed reality television to focus on the recording of the greatest possible amount of material over a relatively long period of time. And the realities of digital prevented certain kinds of decay. Reality series have become bigger, wider streams of content than were historically possible in an analog age. And the ubiquity of distribution has allowed their elements to be transferred around the world at the speed of light, beyond the reaches of the professional class who scurry to catch up. Susan Boyle reaches millions first because she knows what to do in front of an audience and in front of a camera. And she goes global because of the ubiquity and low cost of storage and distribution. To the confusion of the broadcaster and the producer and the traditional media and the traditional media fame machine scrambles in the wake of amateur activity to professionally make money from her popularity. Increasingly, those of us who work in a professional celebrity-based fame machine find ourselves challenged by a professionalized amateur industry of popularity. All through the last five years, my company, like many others of a similar history, has moved through a series of emotional adjustments similar to the Kubler-Ross model, the commonly called seven stages of dying. <laughs> Sometimes emotions, chiefly denial, resignation, and anger, have coexisted inside the organization. But in a way, our shifting understanding of the implications of the digital age are reflected in my two titles. On the one hand, as the executive responsible for marshalling the company's limited resources around its business activities to maximum effect, which is what Wikipedia says is my job. And on the other hand, as creatively leading a small experimental cell inside the company focused on non-television-based digital production. In the heated Kubler-Ross type conversations which arise within the board of the company about the opportunities offered by digital technology, and in particular by broadband internet, you will often hear senior executives argue, but our unique skill is that we are storytellers. This argument, and the set of assumptions which clusters around it, seems to me emblematic of the greatest challenge facing us. You don't have to be a French philosopher to understand that storytelling is a basic human skill, that we are surrounded by stories, that this speech represents a story, that this conference represents a story, that my career is a story that I tell you and myself, and that our lives are stories we tell each other. When we say our special skill is storytelling, what we really mean is our professional skill is telling certain kinds of linear and non-linear narratives expressed as plots in certain kinds of forms or genres for certain kinds of audiences financed and therefore limited 
by certain kinds of financial arrangements. <laughs> the problem is that the scarcities which made our skills so valuable when commoditized in the analog age have, as I've argued, become replaced by a context of abundance. And so we point at the activities of amateurs and maintain that user-generated material is inferior in quality to ours, that Twitter is not a challenge to television, that our narratives will prevail on all platforms. In my view, it's the kiss of death, or at least the sign of dangerous blindness, to argue that this special skill is it enough to ensure our continued existence as an industry, and patronizing in the extreme to our audiences. And our audiences no longer stick around to be patronized because technology has liberated them. In my view, we, more or less traditional television producers and production companies, have to acknowledge new realities. And the biggest is the fundamental shifting relationship between us and our audience and the content which unites us. This shift can be seen in several places, but primarily operates in the spaces of making and in the spaces of meaning. So we are living through a period of profound structural change in the funding of media content, driven by the shift from scarcity to abundance and heralded by the shift from analog to digital. 